St. Francis of Assisi says that, said that, some form of the idea of preach always, but when necessary, use words. And we don't live with each other, and so we don't get to see these interactions that we have. And so when we use um, our words to express appreciation, when we're guided through prayer, when we lift each other up and lift others up, we're, we're preaching sermons. Um, I'm glad I have Carol's permission to go a little longer this morning. Um, you can blame him. Um, we're going to start a three-part series this week. I mean, yeah, this week we're starting a three-part series, and we're just not going to leave the book of Jonah for three weeks. Well, we will for the first reading next week, but for the most part, we're going to be focusing our attention on the prophet Jonah. This is to give you a little bit of a, a foretaste for the summertime, because what we're going to do during the summertime is I've got a five-week series called Kids Stuff that I've written, in which we're going to be preaching on, I'm going to be preaching on, you're going to be listening, um, and interacting with me, hopefully, uh, on stories that we have been taught since a very young age, um, and they're really sort of terrifying, scary stories. Um, and so I'm going to ask questions like, why is this a kid's story? Um, what did we learn about God, and what do we learn uh, about ourselves from listening to these stories? And so this Jonah, it, it actually, I pulled it from the series in order to be able to preach it three parts because I love it so terribly much. I mean, this is my favorite, probably my favorite story in, in the whole Bible. Um, so here we go. You've already heard the first three verses, um, and we know that, that Jonah boards a boat, and he starts heading to Tarshish. And here's where we pick up in the fourth verse. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and such a mighty storm came upon the sea that the ship threatened to break apart. And the mariners were afraid, and each cried to his God. They threw the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it up for them. Jonah, meanwhile, had gone down into the hold of the ship and had lain down and was fast asleep. The captain came and said to him, What are you doing a sound asleep? Get up, call on your God. Perhaps the God will spare us a thought so that we do not perish. The sailors said to one another, Come, let us cast lots so that we may know on whose account this calamity has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. And they said to him, Tell us why this calamity has come upon us. What is your occupation? Where do you come from? What is your country? What are the people? From what people are you? I am a Hebrew, he replied. I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were even more afraid and said to him, What is it that you've done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them so. Then they said to him, What shall we do to you that the sea may quiet down for us? For the sea is growing more and more tempestuous. He said to them, Pick me up and throw me into the sea, and the sea will quiet down for you, for I know it is because of me that this great storm has come upon you. Nevertheless, the men rowed hard to bring the ship back to land, and they could not, for the sea grew more and more stormy against them. Then they cried out to the Lord, Please, O Lord, we pray, do not let us perish on account of this man's life. Do not make us guilty of innocent blood. For you, O Lord, have done as it has pleased you. So they picked Jonah up and threw him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord even more, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. But the Lord provided a large fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. <coughs> Another prophet, Isaiah, reminds us that the grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Thanks be to God. So my goal for the next three weeks is for you to become somewhat of biblical scholars in this story. I feel like if we spend three weeks on a story in which there's four chapters, that you guys will be pretty well versed in this to where when you start referencing or thinking about it or you hear it referenced in another time, that you'll, you'll have something to say about it, that you'll know a little bit about it. So we're just going to sort of dive into the story more or less over the next three weeks. Now, 
Before we even get started, before we even move to, to the next step, what I need to say to you is no matter how you view this story, whether it is figurative or whether it is literal, whether you believe that a big giant fish swallowed a man whole and lived in that fish's belly for three days, or whether you look at this story and go, eh, I don't really believe that happened. It, it doesn't matter. Let me, let me say that. It doesn't matter which side you come down on, okay? Because there's some of you in here who have the, the scientific mind, the scientific brain that goes, man, it, it, it couldn't happen. It just couldn't happen. Somebody couldn't live in the belly of a whale for three days. That's fine. Others of you say, it had to happen. God said it. I, I, he meant it. I believe it. It had to happen this way. That's fine. Mainly because the whale, the fish, not the whale. It's not a whale. It's a fish. That's how bad it is. I'm the fish is one verse. You hear that? Like the fish is one verse. That's all we hear. The fish comes, swallows Jonah. That's it. That's it. He's in the belly for three days. The next week we'll get to the prayer. That's it. That's all we hear about. And then the fish spews him out, spits him up, throws up, whatever, on the dry land. That's it. That's all that the fish plays. Okay? So really it's this very tiny, minute point in the story. Don't miss the bigger meaning. Because it still speaks no matter how you view this story. All right? You all friends now? Okay. Just making sure. The prophet is called to go to the enemy. I love how the Jesus story the Bible tells it that I read to the kids. Called to go to his enemy. Nineveh is the capital of Assyria. Assyria is one of the major empires of the ancient Near East. And so Assyria has been doing some massively negative, bad, terrible, awful things to the people. Specifically the Hebrews. Specifically Jonah's people. Because Jonah's hearing this and going, you want me to do what? I mean, this is... This, is, this isn't, we, we can't comprehend this, I don't believe. I just don't believe we can comprehend it. It's way worse than Carolina Clemson kind of sort of thing. It's way worse than Duke, North Carolina. I know the game's on Wednesday. You didn't have to say anything about it. It's way worse than any of those things that we want to play in our minds. Listen, friends, I, I'm telling you, this is, this is way worse than us talking about, you know, Christians versus Muslims here and now, okay? This, this goes far beyond this. This was a group of people who tried to exterminate another group of people. This is, this is serious business. And this is who Jonah is called to go and, and witness to. You can imagine. You can imagine that, that Jonah's gut took a hit. What? You want me to do what? It sort of puts it into perspective when Jesus says later on, a few years later, he says, love your enemies. I, mean, I think we got our list in our minds and we go, yep. I can love them. I can love them. I don't think I can love them. Love your enemies. Those are Jesus' words that were also spoken to Jonah. Okay, so hard, hard lesson immediately to love our enemies. I mean, that, that, that alone, you, you walk out of here, you don't get anything else. Loving your enemies. You hear that over and over and over again, that's enough for you to, feed on, to, to feast on for the next week. But there's more. All right, so he boards a, a boat. Uh, instead, he sets out for Tarshish. Now, we don't know where Tarshish is. Um, there's plenty of scholars who think it was just a couple days' journey. There's plenty of scholars who believe it's the absolute opposite direction. He wants to go to the ends of the earth to run away from God. Okay? So Tarshish is sort of this place that we're not completely sure. The text says he paid his fare. That's what uh, Elias read to us a second ago, that Jonah paid his fare. The better translation, check this, the better translation of this, that Jonah bought the boat. Jonah, got, Jonah chartered the ship that he was going to ride on. He paid for everything on it. This boat was going to a foreign land full of cargo. We know it's full of cargo because they start throwing it off when they get the, into the storm. Paid for the whole boat. Jonah is a man of means, right? So much so that he's willing to buy a boat to run away from God. To a place in which some people believe was even a whole year's journey away. So Jonah's like, I'm, I'm going to check this off. I'm going to be gone at least for two years. Just because I don't really want to do what God's told me to do. Now, 
I know, well, anyways. It's a big step, right? Buying a boat to go away from what God wants of Jonah's life. I think this might not be terribly much of a stretch, but to say that Jonah uh, was a slightly off course. You feel that? Jonah's slightly off, of course, from what, what God sort of wants him, him to do. And so, being slightly off course, God provides a, a gentle reminder, maybe a little nudge, in the form of a, a really bad, nasty storm. Bad storm. Big storm. These are sailors. Sailors know about storms. Uh, red at night, sailors delight. Red in the morning, sailors be warned. I, I think that's right. I, I, I'm going, I'm not a sailor, so I don't know. But, but they know what they're doing. They know what they're talking about. And when a storm comes up and swamps a sailor, you know it's got to be some pretty bad stuff. And I've always viewed, I've always viewed storms as being sort of the, the part of divine judgment that God has for our lives. This is, this is sort of what God uses to, to correct us and to make us, you know, sort of just, this is our punishment. This is our, our, our punishment, is this storm. Or, or that's how we're, that's actually how we've sort of been, been trained for a long time. Uh, many years ago, there was sermon after sermon preached by very fiery, by, by fiery preachers, and they would, they would pound on the Bible, and they would tell you about judgment and, and, and condemnation, and how you were going somewhere south of the equator, and, and things were really bad in your lives. And storms were caused by things you did. The problem is, is that when you look at the end of the story from Jonah, and you, you, you look at, at sort of how this thing plays out, that storm actually saved him. The storm saved him from being completely off of the course from where God wanted him to go. Because we all have courses. We have a direction, we have a purpose, we have an intention that, that we've been born and created with. It's inside us to serve and to love. I, I talked to somebody this week, and, and they, um, they, they were, they, I've never talked to anybody like this before, but they, they said to me, you know, I, I love what I do. I, I feel, and this one, they weren't a church person. They weren't, I mean, they, they were a church person. They weren't a, 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 a minister or anything like that. But they, they understood, it's like, I, I'm right where God called me to be. He wants me to be right there. And you can just tell that they were, they were sort of serving out of their sweet spot is what I say. Is that they, just, they, that they, they were right there where God wanted them to be. And you notice the sad part of, of, of what I just said was that I don't meet many people like that. I don't meet many people who say to me, man, this is exactly where God wants me to be. I meet a lot of people that go, yeah, I'm sort of doing this for right now. And, and, and I just don't know what God wants from me. There's a direction, there's a purpose, there's a course. And, and some of us it's easy to find, and others, we've got to work hard. We've got to work hard to find that course. We've got to work hard to find a purpose. But here's what I know. That unlike Jonah who, who brought in a boat and, and paid for a boat and went in the opposite direction, you, we sitting here are different because you've said yes. You had someplace else that you could have been. Some of you could still be in bed right now. Some of you don't have kids, so you don't have to wake up at some ungodly hour in the morning. You could have been in bed right now. But you said, you said yes to the invitation to come here. To be impacted in a significant way by, by the words of others, by the songs that we sing, by, by, by hopefully uh, words that have been read or spoken here. You said yes, and so this is the first step in the larger, larger point. But it's not the last step. So, so let's keep going in the story because I don't, I, don't want to, I don't want you to miss a few of these points. These are, these are a million, million times more important than, 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 than that first step because there's got to be some continuation. All right, so, so look at the sailor's reaction versus Jonah's reaction to the storm, okay? The storm. Jonah goes down underneath and, and falls asleep. So Jonah's not even paying attention. Jonah's in left field. Jonah's, Jonah's out, out of it. He's like, it, it doesn't matter. I'm on the boat. I finally got safe and sound. I, I'm, I'm, I'm tucked away and I'm good. <coughs> Storm's raging. Jonah doesn't even know it. The sailors who are in charge of the cargo, friends, this is their living. This is what they get paid for. They start throwing the stuff overboard. <coughs> can you imagine? I don't know what everybody in here does, but can you imagine that you go into your office and you start throwing stuff out the window? 
Like if you work on computers, just start chunking them out the window. How long are you going to work at that job? <laughs> right? Not very long. Why are you going to throw drugs out the window at Walgreens, right? <laughs> You're not going to be there very long. It's not, it, it doesn't make sense. That's how scared the sailors were. They were fearing for their lives when given the chance. And here's the tension that we feel with the sailors. The, the sailors have the money on the one hand. This is their income. This is their wealth. Or their lives. And they're throwing, they're throwing the, the, the cargo overboard. Some, some people are so tied up in their work that they would say, take me instead. There may be somebody in here. I, I don't know. It, it, we can't be so tied to the financial possessions of this time, of this world, that we cannot be tied to the money and to the wealth so much so that we lose our lives. It's not that important, friends. You can't love God and money. You hear me? If you don't hear me, hear Jesus. Because he said it. You can't love God and money. Okay? All right, we're all over the map, but, but that's because this story is all over the map. Here we go. The, the, the mariners, they're, they're, we, we learned that these are pagan men. These men on the boat, most of them were men, were, were pagans. They, they did not worship God. They worshiped all sorts of different kind of gods. So, so we read in the story that they all of a sudden start offering uh, prayers to their own gods. Please, God, get me out of this. this whatever God that they worship, they're, they're offering up. They finally decide, let's cast lots. Now, the only way I know how to explain this to you is that, that sort of casting lots is a little bit like gambling. Okay? And so they just throw the cards on the table, and it comes out that it's Jonah. So, okay, check this. Here's, here's what we got. God uses a storm to get Jonah's attention. And now God has used gambling. Are you, are you tracking with this? Both of, in, in your mind, some of you in your mind, you grew up in the Baptist church and you go, oh my gosh, he said gambling. <laughs> yeah, God used gambling. I've never understood why they used They cast lots in order to decide the 12th disciple after Judas was gone. Do you realize that? Go read that in Acts. Anyway, they, the gambling to point to Jonah, to remind the people. Again, this is part of Jonah's salvation here. Is this first part of the story. Jonah is saved because of a storm and because of gambling now. Are there limits to what God's going to do to get God's way? Now, now don't leave here and go buy poker tickets or, 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 or lottery tickets. That's not what I'm telling you to do. Just simply saying that, that no matter how bad we mess up and we stumble and we fall all over ourselves, that God's still going to work. This is how one writer wrote this, this week. This is a tweet. God has only ever had one disposition towards humanity and that is... Wait for it. Love. God has only had one disposition towards humanity, and that is love. There's nothing God's going to stop doing to get to Jonah in this story. Okay? So, Jonah's messed up, right? Bought a boat, going in a different direction. They're out at sea, storms rolling. People are panicking. Um, it's bad news. In spite of all of this, guess what happens? <laughs> the sailors start to believe in God. How about that? How freeing is that? That even in Jonah's disobedience, no matter how we bundle this thing up that we call church, that we call faith, that we call Christianity, God's still going to work. Right? Because Jonah is God's man. Jonah is God's man here, right? Ta called to go to the worst place imaginable. God says, Jonah, do this. Jonah does the polar opposite. Friends, we are not as bad as Jonah, all right? <laughs> they 
a deep breath because we're not as bad as you. You're not as bad as Jonah. Take a deep breath right now. Free yourself from that guilt that you've been carrying around. You're not as bad as Jonah. And God still worked. God still worked. And this is, this is how bad it got for Jonah. Jonah wants to commit suicide. It pains my heart when I hear stories about people taking their own lives. It's a mental illness that we can't seem to get our hand, hands around, our, our minds wrapped around in a lot of situations. And there's nothing more tragic in my mind than that. I think I'm going to preach a sermon on that in a couple of weeks because that was one of the questions that some of you asked. It was about suicide. And the thing you need to hear more than anything else is that when suicide occurs, when somebody takes their own lives, I can imagine God not being angry and, 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 and judgmental sitting on that throne, but it breaks God's heart. And God says, imagine what could have been. That's what Jonah wants to do. He's ready to end it all. That's the depth in which he has gone to run from God's call that he would rather die. It's never a faithful response. And if that's ever a thought that you have, please call somebody. He has the thought. He's ready. He's ready to end it all. He even asks the sailors. Now these are newfound children of God, right? I mean, their minds have, have started to, to shift and they, they've prayed. They've started, they're starting to, to, to think about praying to this God. And so that he goes to them and he says, take my life, throw me overboard, let me die and be at peace, okay? Let it all end. And the sailors say no. Check that. The sailors say, no. not only that, they get back in. They strap back in into their harnesses and they start working even harder to try and save the boat, to save themselves, and to save this man who has no interest in being saved. Friends, this sometimes is our calling in lives. To strap into a situation in which we are trying to save people who don't even want to be saved. It's not easy. And then the first prayer, a whole service, the first, I mean the whole scripture, the first prayer is offered up in verse 14. Doesn't come out of God's man's mouth. Instead, it comes out of the sailors. They call out to the God that we worship, the God that they called Jonah, comes from the sailors. They're praying to God. What do you think would have happened if Jonah had simply prayed the first time? Right? In verse 16, they become believers. They offer sacrifice. And back then, that was the, the sign. You know, it, it, it's, it's sort of like, you know, nowadays we, we just simply have to pray a prayer, you know, Jesus come into my heart and hopefully we mean it when we say it and, 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 and our lives are transformed, our lives are changed. We start living a, a different way. Back then it was like, here's what I'm going to do in order to show that I'm a believer. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sacrifice something. We don't know what they sacrificed, but they offered sacrifice. They became believers. Friends, are you tracking with this whole story up until now? The storm saved not just Jonah, but a whole host of people. A whole boatload. Like literally, a boatload <laughs> of sailors. God is going to get God's way. The church is going to be used. The decision, the choice that we get to, that we get, get to make is whether or not we're going to go kicking and screaming, mad and angry, 
whether we're going to start listening to God's claim and God's call in our lives. As a church, and as individuals, it's pretty much the same. God's call, God's claim on your lives. Are you kicking and screaming or are you going to answer. Now, last point. This occurred to me this morning. I've been running in the morning, early hours, and, and when I run early hours in order to allow cars to know that I'm there, I wear a headlamp. So I, I have this headlamp, and I was running this morning. They actually tell you in, in seminary never to tell stories in which you say last night or, or this morning, because it leads people to believe that you don't prepare sermons ahead of time. Anyways, <laughs> this morning... I was running, and, and the light was cast on the ground as I was looking down, and I found that my feet, as they hit the pavement, were, were just out of reach of the light, but every step I took, I couldn't quite get to step on the light that was in front of me. Now, in your mind, you're going, dummy, uh, it's moving because your head's moving. <laughs> I know why that was. <laughs> and as I was sitting there, running, watching this, feeling this, thinking through this, going, this is what we do. We chase the light. So some of us are like Jonah. We're turning and we're running the other way. But others of us, we're sort of chasing the light. And here's, here's what I want to say to those of you who are chasing the light. Stay at it. You may never catch it. In fact, we, we as Methodists, we have this thing that we believe called Christian perfection. And the idea is that you're never going to get there. You're never going to step on the light because it's constantly going to be moving. But we keep running. And we keep trying. And through God's grace and through God's love and through God's provisions in our lives, we're able to go faster and faster. And then sometimes we have to sort of slow down. We have to take a deep breath. And we have to kind of rest up a little bit. And then we get going again. And we're chasing the light. I love it. I love that image. And I hope, I pray, and in some way, this morning, Jonah is, is, is speaking to you in a, in, a, in a significant way in which you're being called to, to stop running from the direction that you're going or, 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 or that you're in, in, right there answering, but, but chasing that light. I want to encourage you to stay strong. All right? Let's pray right now. Father God, we are ever grateful for Your Word and for the way in which it was put down on paper so long ago, the way in which You spoke through a prophet who came and called people to repentance, but yet who Himself was, was reluctant. And so for those among us this morning who are reluctant prophets, we, we give you thanks for their presence here and we pray that you would speak to them through Jonah and through Jonah's story. Lord, for those who, who've answered the call, I want to give you thanks and praise for, for the way in which they're chasing the light. And pray for strength for them. And Lord, we pray for our, our church our church in particular, that you would have us to be the kind of people you would want us to be here, the, the kind of people who would share your love, your, your grace, your peace, the kind of people who would love our enemies because, because that's what you've called us to do. And set an example for the world to follow suit. God, help us this morning. And really help us every morning and each and every opportunity that we open our eyes, that we may see it as an opportunity to serve you. God, we love you and we thank you. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen.